the, the, the closer Z gets to the real axis, the harder it gets to understand this transform. But for Z far away from the real axis, it's fairly easy. Okay, and um, the suture transform is also fairly localized. So you know, if, if Z is over here, um, one of a W minus Z is uh, large here and small here. So what the suture transform is doing is, is, is trying to look at a local portion of the spectrum. Okay, so, so evaluating the suture transform at this, at this point here tells you a fair bit about what the spectrum is doing near uh, in, this, in this region here. So this is why the suture transform is so good for, for proving local laws. Okay. Um, and the key point in the Wigner case is that even if you're in the bulk of the spectrum, if you want to understand some energy in the bulk of the spectrum, you can approach the, 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 the energy. Um, so even though it's it, in the real line, it's, 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 it's in the interior. Okay. It, it's nowhere near the edge in R. But in the complex plane, it is, it is on the boundary. And you can, you can approximate the energy in the complex domain by, by points that are away from the spectrum. And, so, and this, this is how we understand um, the behavior of the eigenvalue of the NGE by taking um, complex numbers outside the spectrum but, but, but approaching the energy that you want. Okay? So that works great in, in, in the real case. But in the complex case, our spectrum looks like this. Okay? And the still transfer method has some chance of working if you want to understand what, the, what, uh, what is going on near, this, uh, near an energy level on the boundary. But if you're trying to understand the energy level here, there is no point in the complex plane outside the spectrum that you can use to, to analyze um, using the sort of transform. Okay? You would have to enter the spectrum um, in order to, to, for the sort of transform to become effective. And once Z enters the spectrum, uh, we don't have good ways to control this, uh, this, this, uh, this transform. There's no easy ways to control this, this quantity. Um, yeah, because you know, see, the, problem, the problem is, is, is now um, the size of the spectrum yeah, is two-dimensional, and we, we have a complex parameter, which is also two-dimensional, and you, you can't approximate this. Um, you can get around this by making Z quaternionic rather than complex, but that is a whole other story, which uh, maybe I won't talk about. Um, yeah, then again, you can start approximating. But, uh, and that actually, in some sense, is what we actually do in a very, uh, well, okay, it's not, it's not obvious that that's the same thing, but okay, yeah. There are quaternions that are going to be floating around very implicitly in the background, but, uh, but not, not in the foreground. Um, but yeah, but if you, if you, if you, if you want to make, uh, keep yourself in the complex world, uh, uh, you, you have to abandon the sort of transform. Okay, so, um, all right, so that, 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 that leaves uh, the moment method. Uh, sorry, the log potential method as, as our one remaining method. Now, um, okay, so at, at this point, maybe um, I, I'll make, I can at least give a heuristic proof of circle law. Okay, so, um, all right, so um, if you believe uh, that there's a convergence theorem floating around, um, okay, so. You, you want to prove that these spectral measures converge to the circular measure. So hopefully, this should be equivalent to saying that, that for each z, for each uh, spectral parameter z, if you look at the log potential, they should somehow converge to the log potential over here. Now, actually, there are theorems that do this, and it's, it's actually not, not that hard because um, the log function, or actually precise, um, the log function, or more precisely 1 over 2 pi times the log function, is actually the, um, the Green's function, or the fundamental solution for the Lafarsi in the complex plane. That, uh, uh, yeah, so so if, 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 that, uh, if you take the Lafarsi of this function uh, in the distributional sense, you get the Dirac delta. Um, what that means in practice is that there's actually a, a formula to recover. Okay. That you can actually recover the measure from its, its log potential. So, so uh, at least formally, the potential at any given point, so the measure at any given point is minus 1 over 2 pi times the Laplacian of the log potential. Okay, now. Um, of course, uh, if, you, if your measure is not continuous, this is not a function, so you have to interpret this in a probably distributional sense. Um, but but uh, let me ignore these analytical details. But, but roughly speaking, once you know the potential, you can, you can take uh, 
Laplacian, and you, you basically recover uh, your measure. Um, yeah, so in fact, you have a work distributionally. So you, you take a test function, and you test it on both sides, and, uh, and you do also analytical uh, uh, sort of uh, abstract nonsense. But, um, okay, but using this sort of type, something like this, you, you can actually make this step. So this step is, is actually uh, fairly well understood. Um, so you just need to understand um, the log potentials. Now, this log potential is, is an explicit integral. You're integrating the log of something on a disk. Okay? And, and this is something that you can actually compute explicitly. Um, this right-hand side uh, turns out, um, yeah, so it's, uh, you can use, uh, for example, Jensen's formula, or you, you just go ahead and integrate it. I mean, this is, this is basically an elementary integral. Um, and what you can find eventually after some computation is that uh, this, this log potential um, if Z is far away from, from, um, from the spectrum, then this, uh, this uh, uh, circular measure is, is, is equivalent to a point mass. And you just get log Z for Z outside the disk. But for Z in the disk, uh, you get a quadratic function. Uh, and it actually is Z squared minus 1 over 2. So it turns out. So this, this is something that you can compute explicitly. Uh, and these two functions should match. Uh, to, uh, at, so at the boundary when Z is equal to 1, these match to, to second order. Um, so this you can check by um, direct calculation. Um, it's also compatible with this identity. Um, you can check that if you take the Laplacian of this function and divide by 2 pi uh, and put a minus sign, you'll get back the circular rule. It's a nice little computation. You know, so you know, this is quadratic. You get a constant over here, and you get 1 over pi, in fact. Uh, and log is a harmonic function outside of, away from 0, so you get 0 over here. So, um, so this is a function whose Laplacian times this constant is the circular law. And it has the right growth infinity, so it's, it sort of has to be the right, this has to be the, the right answer. Okay, so anyway, this is, this is a computation. Okay, so yeah, this, this heuristic proof is not entirely computation free, but it has less computation than most of the other proofs of the circle rule. So, um, all right, so what we reduced to understanding now, okay, so what we want to show is that if you take one of a, if you take the normalized log determinant of this shifted normalized matrix, okay, this should converge to log z if, uh, if z is bigger than 1, or um, z squared minus 1 over 2, z is less than 1. Okay? Um, so roughly speaking, what we want to show is that the determinant, the, the magnitude of the determinants of this matrix, okay, so this should approximate me. Approximately be something like, uh, I think, uh, z to the n, if z is big. And when z is small, it should behave like the exponential of n times z squared minus 1 over 2. OK, so I'm just sort of taking exponentials of this. Okay, And um, I'm, I'm going to use approximately very, very loosely. Uh, basically, uh, uh, any factor which is um, exponential little o of n uh, will disappear when you take log divided by n. Okay, so this is a very loose approximation. We were only caring about the exponentially growing terms. Anything like polynomial terms, we're just going to ignore. Okay. Um, okay, so roughly speaking, the circle law is really a statement about determinants. It's a statement about what these determinants look like. Now, how do we understand these determinants? So there's, there's a bunch of ways. Um, so we want this for every z. So let, let's first look at the z equals 0 case. Okay, so, uh, so maybe I'll just do this case. Okay, so. OK, so okay. maybe I'll just explain why the determinant, uh, when, when you don't shift at all, when c is 0, is approximately e to the minus n over 2. Um, so this is a computation that you done a long time ago by Turan. Um, so uh, let's, let's do this for the Bernoulli matrix, plus minus 1 is everywhere. OK, so what, what is this determinant? OK, so um, we can do, there are many, many formulas for, for the determinant, and some are more useful than others. Um, so we're going to use the least useful formula for the determinant, usually this is what we don't use, which is the, the, the Leibniz expansion. Okay, so you can expand this as the sum of all permutations um, of the product of zi sigma i i equals 1 to n times the signature. Okay, this is the Leibniz expansion of, of the determinant. You, you sum over all the permutations, you get all these strings, and then, and then you, 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 you multiply by the sign of the permutation, and this is the sum of n factorial terms. Okay? So this is usually fairly intractable. But uh, what we observe, OK, suppose it's in factorial terms. Um, in the case of the 
Boolean design matrix, every single term is plus or minus one. Okay. Um, and uh, because they're all IID, okay, um, each term is going to be plus or minus one equal probability. So, so, so these are all Bernoulli variables. You're summing n factorial Bernoulli variables. Now, they're not quite independent. Um, sometimes, okay, so you know, if, if you, because sometimes permutations cross, okay, so there'll be two permutations which they, they can share a common um, entry. And then because of that, there's some correlation between, between these, these entries. However, uh, what you can see is that uh, even though they are sometimes dependent, the covariances between any two of these products is zero. Because no matter which two permutations you pick, as long as they're different, uh, one of the permutations will contain will involve um, an entry which is not contained in the other one. And that guy has, has a random sign and is independent of everybody else. And so the covariance, the, the product of any two of these terms is, 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 is zero. So, they are at least pairwise independent signs. They're not jointly independent, but they're pairwise independent. So that's still good enough to understand at least the, the mean invariance of this quantity. So this random variable has mean zero and variance. I'm sorry, there's a, there's a factor. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, let me back up a little bit. Uh, maybe, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, no, no. This is. This, this, uh, that's right. Uh, what's wrong here? Ah, okay. Yeah, there was a one over root n normalization when, when you take a determinant e that gives n times. Okay, sorry. Okay, so this sum has mean zero and variance n factorial because you're adding up n factorial pairwise independent signs of plus minus one, um, but then you multiply by, by, by this quantity here, uh, so uh, the variance gets divided by n to the n, which by Stirling's formula is about e to the minus n. Okay. Uh, up to factors which I'm going to ignore. Um, so the standard deviation of this quantity is about e to the minus n over 2. And that's why you should expect this, this expression here. Okay. Now, uh, it's a nice computation to do the same thing for other z's. Um, and uh, you get a more complicated expression for the variance, but you can, you can still use this, this usually bad idea of taking the, 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 the Leibniz expansion. And you can still compute the variance of, 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 this, of this determinant. Um, and the standard deviation. And if you, um, you have to make one leap of faith, which is uh, you have to assume there's enough con concentration of measure that the, the standard de deviation is actually the typical size of, of, of your matrix, of your determinant. But if you do that, you will actually get back um, uh, um, this, this formula here. So it's, it's a nice little computation. Maybe, uh, I don't know if Nick is, is planning to, to, to do that, or, or maybe we'll get you to do it, but uh, that, that's, that's, that's one. Um, uh, uh, okay, so this, this is the, the quickest heuristic expression I know, which still has some calculation, but, has, but, but less than, than usual uh, for the circular law. Okay, uh, but it is not rigorous. Um, and um, yeah, uh, particularly because the, um, controlling the variance uh, doesn't play well with the log. Uh, um, yeah, and, and there isn't enough concentration of measure to, to actually make this really work properly, but it, it is so heuristically correct. All right, so we do something else. Um, all right, yeah, so, so how, to, how to control the log of the determinant Okay, and I guess it's also normalization. Okay, so um, yeah, so computing the variance of the determinant is is suggestive, uh, but it doesn't tell you everything. I think it gives you like an upper bound of this of this quantity, but not a lower bound, right? something like that. There's, there's a Jensen inequality that intervenes at some point, and it only, only goes one way. Okay. Um, so, as I said, the whole problem is that this matrix is not Hermitian, um, and uh, we don't understand non hermitian matrices very well. So uh, the key trick at this point is what we now call the Gurkha hermitization trick. Okay, and it's very simple. The determinant of a matrix, even if, it's, if, it, if a matrix is not hermitian, this determinant is related to the determinant of a hermitian matrix. You can multiply A by its, by its, uh, uh, by its adjoint. And um, the determinant of this guy is a square uh, in absolute value. So it actually becomes crucial that it's absolute values here. Um, the absolute value of, of this, in fact, well, this is positive, but the, uh, the, this determinant is the square of this. So I guess I've put, I need to put one half here. 
Okay, so the de determinant of this non-hermitian matrix is related to the determinant of, of this um, hermitian matrix. Um, and so actually, all you need to do Okay, so this quantity is also the same as uh, I think one over two m log determinant of um, um, of this emission matrix. So, um, and we understand much better how to, to uh, understand uh, spectral measures of emission matrices. So. For this matrix, the moment method, so to transform method, they work. Um, and so we understand the law of this. Okay, so the, 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 eigen, the, the eigenvalues of these are understood. Uh, um, can be understood. Okay, so, so, so you can write this in terms of the eigenvalues. So this is the same thing as, uh, um, okay, so in terms of the eigenvalues, this is one of a 2n times the sum of the logs of, of the eigenvalues of these things. So it's actually um, the same thing as 1 half times the integral of log x and to infinity against the spectral measure of this matrix here. Get the, the empirical structure of this guy against log x, you're just summing all the logs, the eigenvalues, that's the same as log determinant. And then this is and this is a normalization, and then this is this one over n here, one over two here. Okay. And this is the type of thing we understand. So, so in fact, the eigenvalues of this matrix, uh, these are just the squares of the singular values. Okay, so another way to think about this. Um, these eigenvalues, you just take the singular values of, of this matrix and you square them, and, and that, that's, that's, what, uh, that's what the eigenvalues are. Um, another way of saying it is that the, the absolute value of a determinant matrix is not just the product of the eigenvalues, it's also the product of the singular values. And so you can use singular values, which are much more stable than eigenvalues. Um, so basically, we just need to understand the singular values of, of this quantity here. Okay? And, we, and this can be done. Okay? So, um, yeah, so in the work of Gerko and then later by and, and several other people, they carefully computed the, um, 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 this law, and th they, they found that, that these guys converge to, to some limiting law. Okay, so there's the, in fact, I think it's, I think it's the, the Manchenko Pasteur law, maybe some, uh, it's a perturbation of, of the Manchenko Pasteur law. But, um, th but there is an explicit um, uh, limiting law, it depends on z. Um, but for each z, there's a limit law for this thing, which converges, and so what you would like to say Okay, so um, th this this distribution converges in a reasonable, like in the vague in the vague sense to, to mu z. So what you'd like to say is, is that this integral should converge to to log x times this integral, you know, whatever the limiting measure is. Okay, and if you can if, if if you can justify this, then you just need to compute this this integral, which is a somewhat exp uh, it's an explicit integral involving special functions, but it can be done. And miraculously, after a somewhat serious computation, you get back exactly what you need, which, which is these quantities here. Um, so th that is the original strategy of Gurkel. Um, and, uh, um, but there is a problem here, which is um, the convergence that you have uh, is, is convergence in the vague topology. So what that means is that when you, you, when you multiply th this measure against any continuous function, compactly small continuous function, you, you will converge to, to, to what you expected, what you wanted to converge to. But yet you're integrating against log, and log is not quite continuous uh, at the boundary. Okay? It's, it's not a continuous compact supported function. So your spectrum is, is non negative because now we have singular values, okay? and log looks like this. And it's not uh, continuous. Uh, it, it, it's unbounded at plus infinity, and it's, and it's unbounded at, at zero. Now, um, the bounded plus infinity is not a real problem because we, we understand very well the. Um, the operator norm. Okay, so we have all these good bounds, really good bounds on the um, largest singular value of these matrices. And roughly speaking, um, we know that, that, that the measure, the spectral measure is usually supported in some bounded set, like it, like it doesn't really, you know, it normally doesn't even exceed two. Um, and so you can cut off, okay, the, the, the singularity and infinity is, is, is really easy to deal with, uh, particularly since log grows so slowly. Uh, but so the real problem comes with the, with the, um, um, the other singularity at zero. Um, yeah, so, so if, if, for example, um, 
uh, if the, the least single value of this matrix is zero, then everything falls apart because, in fact, uh, now you're taking log of zero. This, this is divergent. Everything's divergent. Um, so in order to, you know, even if all the other single values are, are, are distributed nicely, it, it just takes one, you know, the, the least single value can ruin everything. If, if that single value is zero, it doesn't matter that the rest of, the, of, of your measure is, is, is completely well behaved. This, this expression diverges. Um, and so you need bounds on the least singular value um, of, of, of your matrix. Um, but fortunately now we have them. Okay, so, so, the, the, you know, so the whole point of the previous lectures was to develop um, bounds. Okay, so, um, okay, so the, the bounds I gave in the previous lectures are a bit too weak for, for what, uh, what, what you want here. But um, the least singular value of, um, of these matrices, uh, what you can show is that for, for any fixed Z, this would be um, bound from below by, say, n to the same minus 10, okay, with, with reasonably high probability, with really good, you know, probably, I don't know, say, uh, 1 minus big O n to the minus 5 or something. OK, so um, you don't get exponentially good probabilities anymore, um, but you do get reasonably good, 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 uh, good failure rates. And you, you get reasonably good, um, good bounds. Now, this is normally not, not so great, but, but, um, but n to the minus 10, you know, it, it looks really, really small. But um, there's a log function here. Okay, so, so at n to the minus 10, the log function is still, it's still relatively mild. It's, it's, it's only a size log n. So it's still unbounded. Okay, so, so, so now, now, now you can cut away this part of the spectrum, and you, you can work from, uh, say, n to the minus 10 onwards. Um, you have to use some, some entropy net thing to deal with. Uh, so there's, there's many different z's that you need, but there's, there's about n squared z's that you need to care about. And so um, you, can, you can apply a union bound, and, and this error is, is, is fairly manageable. Um, so this, this function is still um, unbounded, but not very unbounded. It's, it's, it's only um, unbounded by a log. So, um, um, so in the early work of, uh, particularly of work of Bai, uh, uh, so they still had this logarithmic loss. Um, and the way they got around that was that they went back to this convergence theory. Um, and um, Bai, spent, in particular, spent a lot of effort proving this type of convergence with a good convergence rate. So, so, so not only uh, do these measures converge as n goes infinity to the limit measure, he found a rate of convergence of, of, of this of the, um, um, of his measure. And his, his rate of convergence was polynomial. It, it converged like n to a minus negative power. Um, this required some, some work, but he was able to do that. And, and that, that uh, rapid rate of convergence was able to counteract this logarithmic growth in, in the log function here. And so he was able to conclude the argument um, at least assuming that, uh, that he needed to assume that the measure, uh, the, um, that the um, individual distributions were not Bernoulli, they had to be somewhat, uh, they had to be, uh, have, have, have continuous distribution and some other condi conditions as well. Um, but uh, yeah, so, um, but, uh, yeah, but when, you, when your measures are, are bad, particularly if they're very heavy tailed, uh, then you don't have this, um, um, this polynomial convergence rate. Um, and so um, th this strategy, um, Actually, um, so a few years ago, Van and I pushed Van Vu and I pushed this strategy as far as, far as as far as it could go, and it was able to handle any ID matrix as long as you had uh, one extra assumption. Uh, in, in addition to the second moment being bounded, you needed some moment above the second moment, say 2.1 moment, to be bounded as well. Um, we needed this extra moment to get a little bit of polynomial um, convergence rate uh, over here, so that you could make the strategy work. But um, the full circle law doesn't have this, this, this extra condition. You only have the second moment bounded, not the not sec second plus epsilon. So uh, we use a different strategy uh, to get rid of that. Um, so just, maybe just very briefly, I'll close with, with what we did there. So, um, so rather than focus so much on, on the limiting law, the limiting circle law, uh, what we did instead was that we focused on proving universality. Okay, so as I said, you don't really have to prove that everybody converges to the circle law. You just need to prove that everybody converges to, uh, to the same thing. And then since you know that, let's say for Gaussian ensembles, the Gaussian guy converges to the circle law. That's enough to make everybody converge to the circle law. So what we, what we try to prove is some sort of uni universality statement. Like if, you had, if you have two ID matrices, uh, say maybe this one was Bernoulli and this one was Gaussian, um, rather than work out what, what these, these guys converge to, uh, we just would like to, to show that, uh, that these we just want to show that this log determinant of, of this guy is close in some sense to the log determinant of the other guy. And again, I won't be precise about what close means. Okay. 
if these are close and you know that one of these guys converges to the right thing, then the other one has to converge to the right thing as well. OK. So, um, okay. so as I said, you, you, can, you can write this as the sum of singular values. Your logs of singular values. Um, that's okay. So uh, actually, for technical reasons, we didn't quite use this particular formula. So there's, there's yet another formula for the determinant which is useful. Um, so maybe I, I just mentioned this. Okay, if, if you have a de determinant of an n by n matrix and the the um, the rows uh, x1 x n, geometrically, what this is, this is the volume of the parallel pipette whose sides are x1 x2 x3 x4. Okay, so it, it's a geometric volume, and so you can use the base times height formula. Um, this quantity is also equal to the base, which is the length of x1, times the next height, which is the, the length of the, of the distance from x1, x2, to the, the space spanned by x1, which I call v1, times the distance from x3 to the space spanned by x1 and x2. Okay, so base times height times height times height, you know, the, the, the n-fold base times height formula. Um, and so this log determinant you can also write as, as, as the sum of a log of various distances, the distance of, of, of each row to the previous guy. Um, each one of these guys is roughly like a singular value. Um, th th there's a relationship between distances of vectors to hyperplanes and singular values. You may have seen some of this in, in actually in, in some of uh, the TA sessions. Okay, so we, we, we used um, this uh, decomposition instead, but, but you should think of it as being like um, the singular values. So, um, so once again, we, uh, we, we have this, this sort of log function, and we have all these eigenvalues or singular values, and we're trying to sum the log function on these singular values or actually um, on, 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 these, uh, on these distances, but, but you can think of it as, as singular values. Um, so because you have the least single value bound, uh, you can show that the very small eigenvalues, the very small single values don't contribute very much to the sum. Uh, the, um, so not, not just the, the least single value, but maybe the first, uh, maybe the first uh, like n to the 0.99 single values turn out to actually give a fairly negligible contribution. You know, they're, they're only n to the minus 0.1 of the, of the whole sum at times log n, and that, that's something which you can handle. And because we still have some convergence, uh, you can get, uh, if you look at the singular values from, say, uh, 0.1n up to n, if you look at the, the bulk of the singular values, here log is bounded, and, um, and, uh, um, and the, the, the convergence, the, the just, just qualitative convergence is, is good enough. And so there was just this, this, this there are these intermediate, the, these sort of smallish singular values, you know, like, um, like the nth 0.99th smallest singular value, which were the real problem. Um, and so there was one additional tool that, that we could use, which is particularly um, uh, apparent using this distance formulation, which is, which is that these distances turn out to obey, to obey a concentration of measurement. Okay, so they have a certain mean invariance, and, they, and the mean invariance is easy to compute. But actually, they are, they're very well concentrated. That, that actually, um, they're, this, they're, they're random, but they, 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 they stay very, very close to their mean value. And you can show that the, the mean value of this quantity doesn't depend on your model. If you change from Bernoulli to Gaussian, the, the mean doesn't change, the variance doesn't change. And so if you have enough, good enough concentration to measure, you can show that the, um, this, um, uh, this distance, the, the distribution of this distance for one model is almost the same as the distribution for another model. And as long as you're, you're staying away from the smallest singular values, if you're working with sort of smallish singular values, these distances also stay away from zero, and so log becomes continuous. And so you can also show that log of the, of the distance for one model is very, very close to log of distance for another model. And so you can show that, that, um, that for even, for even for this most difficult contribution to, to this integral, that contribution is universal. It doesn't depend on the model. Um, and so by combining both the bulk theory, the least single value theory, and then also this concentration of measure theory, we, we use an integral of telegram to, to, to conclude here. Uh, you, can, you can wrap everything up and you can put the full circle of law. Okay, out of time, so that's probably a good place to stop. Thank you. Have any questions? Oh, is there someone else? Uh, Go ahead. Yes. Oh, I see, okay. Uh, maybe the free probability people have a way of thinking about it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, it looks very suggestive. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the semi-circle measure is up to some normalization, the, the projection. That's like the real part um, of the circular law. But I, I, I don't know of a, uh, uh, whether that's just a coincidence or whether there's, there's some, some natural 
reason for that, but yeah, but uh, maybe, the, maybe in free probability land, there, there is some, some explanation for that, but you have to ask an expert in that. Other questions? Yeah. Um, so where are the quaternions um, Right, okay, so to, um, to understand the eigenvalues of, of this quantity here, you don't have to understand the Stilter transform of this. Okay, so you have to take this, and then you have to subtract another parameter. Take the inverse of that, and then take the trace of this. Now, this, um, th there's some way to, to view this quantity as, as uh, the resolvent of Mn minus a quaternion in the inverse in some appropriate ring. I, I forget exactly how it's done, but... but hmm? Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, so quaternion is just code for, for two by two matrices, yeah. Sorry? Um, yeah, yeah, so, um, um, yeah, v variance of this method can show, uh, for example, universality of, of local statistics. Yeah, so, you know, if, if, you, if you take something like, you take, you take some function, some fixed function of all the eigenvalues with some appropriate normalization. Um, you can show that if you change the model, you, you replace one model with, with another model, um, but still means your variance one that, that the law of this doesn't change very much, um, and uh, yeah, so you can you can start proving you know central limit theorems for some of these things by by some methods like this. Um, offhand, I don't remember the exact what's currently known. Um, I mean, there's a limit as to how local uh, you can you can go and, and still have universality. Um, if you go really low, you need matching moments, uh, which I'll talk about next time. Um, yeah, no, there, there, there is some way to adapt this to, to linear statistics, but I, I don't remember the full statement. Uh, all right, uh, so we resume at 3.15 with uh, Robert Berry from NT, uh, NCTM. Uh, let's thank uh, Mr. Paul again.